Okay, let's talk more about the spiritual significance. <clears throat> when you realize that God made seed, God made the sun, God made, um, you know, all these things, uh, they're after a pattern, then you begin to understand that even understanding the natural meaning can in that sense help you to understand the spiritual meaning because it's after a pattern. It's after a pattern. And so uh, you begin to understand something like a water pot. What kind of vessel is a water pot? Well, it's not a decoration. It's not, it is something that is used for service or for serving others. It's specifically to serve the needs of other people. So you see that an empty water pot is absolutely useless. You see what I'm saying? I mean, a decorative pot, you know, you could have something sitting around and not have anything in it, and it's not useless. It's serving its purpose. But a, a vessel that is made to serve others is absolutely useless if it's empty, okay? And so that brings up a spiritual thought that, well, then if, if we're the vessel and we're empty, what's the point? So that gives us meaning in life. That gives us purpose, and that is to be filled. That gives us purpose not just to be filled for our purposes, but for the purposes of God and others. Um, you know, the scriptures talk about uh, uh, stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. And it says, uh, don't, you know, don't fulfill the lust of the flesh, but by love serve one another, you know. Um, by this perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren, for the brethren. We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for Christ's sake. All of those are different scriptures, all throughout the scriptures, and they all testify in the, uh, to the same truth. In other words, that is a universal truth. That is a universal truth. You can, that's a truth with God that he didn't just save us for ourselves, but he saved us that we might be for the benefit of others also, that we might serve the needs of others. Okay, so knowing that spiritual truth, searching the scriptures, finding scripture after scripture that testifies of that, eventually what happens is the truth, it's like you hear that once or you read it once and it kind of goes in and it doesn't stick, but then you hear it again and it starts catching. And then I, you hear it enough times and pretty soon you begin to realize, you know, I mean, you realize it for yourself. You realize it as a universal truth. Therefore, it must be applied here. I don't exist for any other reason if, uh, other than to serve. And if I'm empty, what good am I? I can be an empty vessel in relationship to serving the Lord, but a very busy vessel. You know what I'm saying? I can be very busy, but what good am I? Uh, busyness is not what God wants. Uh, uh, accomplishing tasks. Well, I'm very goal-oriented. I'm totally empty, but I'm very goal-oriented. That doesn't, uh, you know, it doesn't do what God wants you to do. So we're going to see from these scriptures that the Lord wants us filled to serve his purposes. <clears throat> okay, verses uh, 3 and 4 says, uh, And when they lacked wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto them, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. So Jesus is making a reference here to the when he said, Mine hour is not yet come. All you got to do is search the scriptures, uh, particularly the Gospel of John, and you will find that at different junctures he says, Mine hour is not yet come. But at a certain juncture, he finally says, mine hours come. Anybody know where that's at? Raise your hand if you know. Roger? Gethsemane. Hmm? Gethsemane, okay, yeah. Uh-huh, Jared? Okay, uh, Eric? John 12, 20? 23. Absolutely. He says in 22 and 23, 
you, you, some of you are familiar with John 12, 24, right? 23 says, my now, uh, verily, verily, I say unto you, what it has, you got it right there, don't you? Now has, the hours come that the Son, and the King James says like this, the hours come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Now, all up until this time, he says, mine hour has not yet come. Mine hour has not yet come. Mine, but now has come the time of the cross, the time in, uh, just, just, uh, just before Gethsemane and, and Calvary, where he is realizing his hour has come, the hour of glorification. But the hour of glorification for him is not when he's glorified, but when he glorifies the Father. He understands water pots. Do you understand the difference? We think, we look at that and we say, okay, the hour of glorification must be the resurrection. But Jesus didn't refer to the resurrection. He referred it specifically to his death when he said, the hours come that the Son of Man should be glorified verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto you, except this corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone, but if it die, it brings forth much fruit. So the glorification for him wasn't the resurrection where he comes up and he goes, I'm glorified, I'm glorified. The hour of glorification for him was when he laid down his life for the plan of the Father and the Father was glorified. He served the purposes of the Father. You know, and until that spirit gets hold of you, you'll never really, you can understand principles, you can hear all this stuff, but there, it only comes through the life of another, and it is the life of Christ, and it comes through giving yourself for another. And in this case, he gave his life for the Father, and you say, hey, my hour for glorification has come. I'm going to lay, I'm going to, remember David, when they said uh, he had to offer this offering, and he went up on this certain place where he's going to offer it, and the guy said, hey, you know, I'll give you the, the land, and I'll give you the calf, and I'll give you everything you need to, to do it, and David said, no way, no. Well, we'd go, well, why not, David? Get up there, take the land, take the calf, offer the thing, get on with it. That's, that's God blessing you. Prosperity gospel. That's God blessing you. They missed the fundamental thing of the nature of Jesus Christ. David said, God forbid that I should sacrifice without it being a sacrifice. You know what I mean? Without it costing me. How about that? God forbid that I sacrifice without it costing me. Because that's what sacrifice is. And I've come here to sacrifice, you know. But we miss that spirit, see, because we go, oh, life is God blessing me. Life is God taking care of me. Life is, you know, I'm the center of the universe and, and what God's interested in. But then, and that, that's true in his heart. Because he does bless you and watch out for you and do all this. But folks, that'll make you self-centered. You continue in that long enough. There comes a time when you must grow up and go, I'm going to be like my father. I'm going to be like my father. And he's given to me, and now I'm going to give back. And, I, and it's going to cost me, and I'm going to work hard, and I'm going to... And it begins to work in you. And it's not as fun. You don't get as many blessings and gifts. But there's, there, is, there is peace. There is, there, uh, there is all... That is, that you ever could want there. But you can't, a person that's not there yet can't understand that. They're going, what are you talking about? You know? And, and I've seen it around here. I've seen it in the church. I've seen it in the Bible school. I've seen people who don't understand that spirit at all. I mean, hey, you're disturbing me here. Well, that's okay. I mean, we're trying to accomplish something for the greater good. Forget the greater good. Can't you see I was trying to search the scriptures to learn Jesus and you stopped that? Boy, apparently I stopped it real bad. <laughs> Jerry? Right.
It's a martyr spirit is what I call it. Right. You know, we call them a goody two-shoes. All right, let me read a little bit of my notes. Verse 3 and 4. It was told to Jesus, we have no wine. He had to tell them that his hour was not yet come for the new wine for, for the new wine to come. The hour was not yet come for the new wine to really come forth. That he could work a miracle after the type of the hour of his glorification or after a shadow. He was about to do... He, his hour was not yet come. So he couldn't, in a practical manifestation of the truth, lay down his life and show them what it was all about at this stage. But he could work a miracle that was after the pattern and after the type of what he was eventually do. Do you understand? And that's exactly what he did. He said, my hour's not yet come, but I can do this. <laughs> and he wasn't just going, hey, I'm a cool miracle worker. I can do some things. I can live in your party. You know, we don't understand. He is totally focused on the Father's plan. He is, you know, like it says, his, his face was set as a flint. He was totally dedicated to the Father's plan. He wasn't showing off with miracles, this was his first miracle. His first miracle was after the pattern of the truth. That would he would eventually lay down his life and die. Um, let's see, verse 5, I have... Um, his mother saith unto the servants, Whatever he saith unto you, do it. <clears throat> I wrote, The great miracle here is not that the water was turned into wine but that someone came to knowledge. It was the servants that knew Jesus. To them, there was not just new wine, but, to Je the, but that Jesus was the new wine. To, uh, they came to knowledge. Everyone had new wine freely, and, that, and they had that as an automatic because Jesus did the miracle. Everyone had the new wine. It was a free gift. Nobody had to pay for it or anything. But it was not so for the servants. They were told, whatsoever Jesus saith, do it. The logos. He's the center. He's the beginning. He's the source from which it's going to come. The word, too. Whatever he says, he's the word. Whatever he says, do it. Plug into this guy right here. And they did. Everyone else, no, they, I probably got this written, but they didn't know where it came from. They just went, they thought the, the head of the party brought it and thought, well, this is a good gimmick. Most people bring in the best at first. When everybody's drunk, then they bring in the bad stuff because they go, they're so drunk, they don't know it's bad anymore. You gave us, you know, the, oh, and then you brought in the best for the last. What a, but they didn't give Jesus credit. But Jesus didn't want that kind of credit. And that's what people don't understand in the ministry today. They seek that kind of credit. He didn't want, well, Jesus is the one that gave us this. Thank you, man. That's real cool. Jesus wanted to be seen as the Logos, the one, the source from which the new comes and the old is done away. Um, they obeyed and gave place to the Word. They brought their body under subjection to the obedience of the word and the result was new wine. Everyone else at the marriage were benefactors of the obedience of the servants who heard his word and acted on it. See, Jesus didn't just stand there and go, poof, new wine. Never move, never flinch, just poof, new wine. That's what, that, that is somehow what we think Jesus is like and he's not. There is, he is wanting to work the Word wants to be made flesh and get in people and people respond to the Word and let it become part of them and they act and it brings forth from the Logos, the Word that has not just that is there but, is, but was from the beginning that is now there, that is now working in them through obedience that, that brings about a certain action that brings God and man together and bam, then you've got something of spiritual significance, not just a miracle, but, they, but we don't see that. We would rather Jesus be like, you know, I dream of genie. Ding, ding, ding. 
you know, no man, no involvement, whatever. These guys knew. They heard his word. They got involved with him. They met the others, benefactors. Benefactors. A lot of benefactors in this world. And they go, oh, I want to be in, I want to be a benefactor again. Give me another miracle. Make me a benefactor again is all they're saying. That's all they're saying. Make me another benefactor again. And he's good. He'll benefit you more than anybody. He is a blesser beyond anything. He gives more. But if you are his son, if you are his child, if you are in his family, he would like for you to understand the principles through which this works and to flow with him and to come up and say, whatsoever he says, do it. You're the word, you're the logos, you're the complete thought. Here we are. We're the vessels. What do you want us to do? And it's significant what he had him do. I thought I said, Ricky. Yeah. And that's another example of coming to the Logos, not just to Jesus of Nazareth, who, who is a miracle worker, though he is a miracle worker. And you and I and every one of us have been benefactors at one point or another. But we want to change our relationship to Jesus. Uh, uh, here's Jesus, here's Mary, here's the servants, here's all the benefactors. And we want to begin to move, well, you know what I mean? We want to become more related to him in the way that he is and not this and really it's not even this way that when you're the benefactor it's not it's more like this it's what we get it is you know and waiting you're in a you're in a waiting posture you're in a receiving posture you're in a well, i don't know why god doesn't do something type thing you know i mean i'm sitting here going i want you to do something but over here they're acting they're, they're hearing this she's giving the word she's pointing to the word they're acting on the word and it's bringing forth all this for the benefactors. And they may just they may just say, well, God is a good God, and, you know, wowie, zowie, man, I want to just follow God. I mean, this is really cool. You get wine when you want it. You get bread when you want it. Not realizing that you don't get wine when you want it. You get bread when you want it. When somebody presses through that crowd and touches the hem of his garment, when somebody goes and acts on his word, then the Logos manifests in those kind of ways. But even the manifestation to him has spiritual significance, but to us is simply a temporal act from which we have benefited and we miss the spiritual significance. And I'll give you an example of that. The scripture says this. This is word of God. It cannot be broken and cannot contradict. Be not drunk with wine, but be filled. Be not drunk with wine, but be filled, right? Jesus said, verse 7 says, Jesus saith unto them, fill the water pots. Fill the water pots. Fill. Okay? He didn't say fill the water pots, turn it into wine, everybody get drunk. They, got, they took that and they said, look, we got lots of wine, let's get drunk. They said, you know, let's, let's go get drunk. Jesus said, be filled, don't be drunk. And on the day of Pentecost, they were filled with the Spirit. They were not drunk, though they looked like they were drunk, but they were filled. But they were not drunk. But they were filled. And, uh, and Jesus didn't do this miracle with the intention of just letting people get drunk so that they can feel better. But they did. They acted on the very God-given miracle, provided wine, drank it up, said, wow, man, this is really cool, you know, and what a great party, and that was really cool. Oh, you know, that was the first miracle of Jesus. We got in on that, baby. That's really cool. I remember the tingly feeling. I never had one quite like that over wine. You know, that was really cool. Totally missed it. Totally missed 
the spiritual significance. Let me tell you, God does miracles. God does miracles all the time. He'll do miracles for you. And, and he's done many a miracle for me. I didn't see the spiritual significance. But there came a day that I said, I don't want to just be a benefactor that's coming this way. I don't want to be one of the ones up here. I don't want to be a benefactor. I want to be either a servant or one that goes, hey, look, you know, you guys got a problem? We got the source right over here. We got the word right here. Whatever the word says, go with it. You know, one that points, and then somebody that goes, cool, what do you say? Fill the water pot, you got it. You see what I mean? Somewhere, I want to I want to progress in my relationship beyond just being a benefactor. And let me tell you, you see a lot more when you progress beyond that. Unless you start hanging with people like this. If you hang with people like this, you get to be a benefactor in a greater way because they're plugging into the Lord all the time. But you're still just being a benefactor. Don't hang with them so that you can get more benefits. Hang with them so that you can learn how to progress closer, to act on the Word, hear the Word, and then eventually, when the situation arises in the natural, you go, we got the Logos, the complete thought and concept of God right here. Let's go with it. And you see what I mean? And, and you change circumstances instead of the circumstance being there. Somebody else moves with the Lord. The circumstance change. And you're blessed by it. Oh, look at the comfort of the change. Look at the blessing of the change. Isn't this nice? God must be for us, and I feel comfort in that. But somebody probably laid down their life. You know what I mean? Somebody gave of themselves for you to be able to even get in on that and for you to just receive it as a comfort blessing or something is, is not good. Um, they, were to be, they were to be full so that there was room for nothing else. One of the advantages of being full is there's not room for anything else. Fill, Jesus said, fill the water pot. And, and if you notice, it says uh, in verse 6, And there were set uh, six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews containing two or three firkins apiece. They weren't full. They never were full. Those water pots were never full. But when Jesus comes on, Jesus says, Let's fill them. You need to be full because there's an advantage of that. The first immediate advantage is if you're full, there's not room for anything else. It's not just a good idea. It's a helpful, it's, it'll, it'll avoid a lot of other stuff. But if you're not full, then something you're going to fill in with something else. And that's a fact, and you know it deep down inside, because it will happen. Seek the Lord with all your heart. Go after the Lord with everything you can, and don't let all that other junk slip in. And don't compromise. Uh, the greatest purpose we can serve is to be full of Christ, and not just carrying out some duty for God. So the water pots are even more, the servants are carrying out a duty for God, but the water pots are being filled, filled. Um, in this sense, we're not trying to get more of Jesus. He is, he is in us full and complete. But we need to realize the fullness of him that filleth all in all. We need to realize that he is the fullness. This is the only way to truly realize he is the fullness is to understand he is the Logos. Because as Logos, he's the complete thought and he is the fullness. He's the complete thought and concept of God. When you realize that he is the Logos, you'll quit trying to fill in with your little good ideas and plans and whatever. You'll go, what can I offer? Uh, here's the Logos here. What do you say, Lord? You, you know what I mean? You'll go to the Lord. You won't even have to go, oh, man, I forgot to check out, you know, have you ever done that? I, I forgot to check with the Lord on this. I can't believe I forgot. Well, you know, just frankly, you know, when you're not, don't have any, you know, he's the fullness and you don't have anything, you're an empty vessel, you will find yourself going, what do you think, boss? <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, what, you know, what do you think? And, you know, everybody has good ideas. Everybody has good stuff. But, None of it's worth anything if it's not Christ. That's why we have to be filled with Christ. 
Um, he has not given us less fullness. He has not given us less than fullness, though we know less. He's given us all fullness. And the scriptures declare this. We have now. You, you're not waiting for it. You're not thinking, well, if I go through two or three years of Bible school, I'm going you know, to get more fullness. That's not the truth. That's not what you're here for. You have all fullness. The, the desire is that the Holy Spirit awaken you to when Jesus, when Jesus gets put in authority over a vessel, he says, fill it up. You know, when we're in authority over it, we have two or three firkins for purifying sake. I think I got that down here. But uh, uh, the water pots weren't full. They were the water pots weren't full. They were after the purifying of the Jews. Do you see what I mean? Not the purifying of the Lord, but the purifying of the Jews. But must be full, and then draw it out. You get full, then you can draw it out. Remember how many vessels, you know, different situations where they filled the vessel up and then they started pouring out and it just kept pouring and pouring and pouring and pouring and pouring and pouring. You're going, how could all that be in there? It is the result of all fullness. And the fullness is not based on the containing ability of the vessel, but the true fullness that is Christ. The vessel when full is only full of its own ability to contain but in reality you're not receiving some sort of you're not trying to fill you up you are trying to come to fullness there really is a big difference there and I know that for years I tried to be filled in other words like come to a certain amount in me but when the Holy Spirit began to show me that Jesus is a fullness that is you know, I've drawn it before this huge, vast fullness, and I'm this little funnel here, and I'm plugged into all this fullness. Then huge amounts out of your innermost being shall flow rivers, not a river, rivers of living water. You know, that's, you know, we go, well, you know, I just, I got a little squirt today or something, you know. You know, we get a little spurt of something. You know, that's just proof. That we're trying to we're trying to fill us up. We're looking at us. We're working on us. We're concentrated on us. We're not concentrated on Him who is all fullness. You go, man. I want to put. You know, the the branch becomes a partaker of all the root and fatness of the vine. So it plugs in there. It's got access to the whole thing. Total access. And what happens to a branch that truly plugs plugs into that fullness? It grows. It gets bigger. It's able to contain more. It brings forth more fruit. It does more. But it, what is it? All it's doing is opening itself more and more and more to the fullness that was not of itself in the first place. That's all it's done. It has not become better. It has not become wiser. It has not become more perfected. It has not done anything in relationship to itself. The growth of itself is an automatic of its reality and abiding in the, his fullness. In other words, his concentration has been to him who is fullness. His concentration has been to see to it that you expand apportionately, which we call growth. You will grow when you quit worrying about yourself. I know that sounds weird. You, you grow less when you are concentrating on yourself. Case in point. Make yourself holy. Come on. Make you concentrate. I want you to concentrate on holiness for the next two years. Make yourself holy. Really get after it and you be holy. We'll all meet back here in two years and see how you're doing. And I guarantee when you concentrate on you being holy, you get worse. But when you concentrate on be ye holy for he is I'm going to be not do I be because he is and he is the being that I'm plugged into then then I have hope but I have no hope in myself so 
but but the vessels must be full then you draw out then you draw out be not drunk with wine but be filled most people who are filled are drunk Jesus wasn't just trying to give drunks more wine Jesus understands the Jews' law and manner of purification, how they trying to get holiness to man. These earthen vessels stood in their own holiness. Two or more, two or three of the firkins isn't going to get it. That's what I wrote right here. Two or three firkins isn't going to get it. You may be able to get your feet clean, but that's it. You must be full, not just for cleansing, but for satisfying the thirst of those who are with you. And a lot of times, we want to get just enough to clean up our act so we'll look good. And he said, those water pots are for others. They're for anybody that comes into your house to help clean them up. Not just to get your little feet clean so that you're something, so that you look good, and then you can look at everybody else's dirty feet and go, well, what's wrong with you guys? You know what I mean? But instead, you have a mission. I could, I could, I could settle for two or three firkins because that would satisfy my need. But I want to go, I want to know fullness so that I can be for the cleansing of others, for the help of others. <clears throat> they were to be full so that there was room for nothing else. A water pot is a vessel for service and not for decoration. An empty vessel is useless, so we've already discussed that. All right, talking again about the purifying of the Jews. The manner of purifying was only two or three firkins. The water pots weren't full. They were after the purifying of the Jews. Jesus understood the Jewish laws and manner of purification. And he knew that it wasn't sufficient. The letter is not sufficient. He understands it, and he understands it's not sufficient. Had there been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness would have come by the law. But it couldn't, so he did away with the old, and he brought in the new. Great plan. See, what you're trying to do is take the old, an old garment, and patch it up. So a new patch on it, you know, and of course, you know what Jesus said about that. And so, so new patch on an old garment, it tears that away and makes the tear worse. You know, you're trying to, you think of you in terms of old. Instead of you have been joined to the new and all things have become new. Thank God he crucified you. Can anybody say, thank God he crucified me? <laughs> I mean... That is good news, Molly. Right. Yes. No, I under, yeah, I understand what you're saying. Well, it's the same as I've often said that, you know, when God created everything, he created out of nothing. You know, I mean, you can't get any lower than nothing. And he took nothing and he brought forth a new creation. He took yucky water and he brought forth new wine. So I believe that that principle is true. <clears throat> so the two or three firkins is the measure, is their measure of righteousness their measure of righteousness. These earthen vessels stood in their own holiness and were satisfied with the little bit of cleansing that it did. Jesus didn't say, put five firkins in. Think about it. Had two or three firkins. He didn't say, put five firkins in. He said, fill them to the brim. Did you notice that? Fill them to the brim. <clears throat> Our righteousness is measured in firkins, or meaning it's limited to certain acts, but not his. 
We don't receive righteousness by measure, but we receive Christ who is the measure of righteousness, the full measure of righteousness. It's not after the manner of the purifying of the Jews. We are made righteous by faith in him, and he is the full me- Jesus is the measure of God's fullness. <clears throat> so we must be full, not just for cleansing of yourself, but the cleansing of those who are with you. Not just the cleansing the outside, but from the inside out. It's interesting because the, the foot washing cleans the out, but the new wine, you know, and even, and it's really true. I mean, you know, uh, the scriptures say, drink a little wine for thy infirmities and whatever. You got stomach problems, you got this stuff, drink wine, it has alcohol and whatever. I mean, there is, you know, of course, like I said, anybody that wants to go get drunk or whatever will use that as an excuse, but there's this truth that it has medicinal purposes, meaning that it cleanses the inside. We're on our measure of righteousness is two or three firkins and doing a couple of acts that look good and accept me now and he goes without being filled to the brim with the fullness himself you don't measure up. Nobody can all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No man measures up. That's why we need Jesus as our righteousness. And see, this is what, see, he's sitting there thinking all this. He's involved in all this, and everybody else is going, oh, we're going to get some wine out of this. That's a good deal. You know, and he's totally consumed with this reality of, of, uh, of what he's come for and the difference, and they're just kind of going along with the party. <clears throat> uh, these, these pots never have, never have been filled any further than two or three firkins because that is as far as their righteousness allowed. This is the beginning of miracles for the believer when he is filled full with the knowledge that Christ is his righteousness. This is the beginning. When you realize that you're filled full, Christ is your righteousness. It's not based on your little deeds or how good you did this week or whatever. Your righteousness is your faith is counted to you for righteousness. And that's it. The beginning of miracles for the believer is that he is brimmed full by the Father. (laughs) We are not trying to get more of Jesus. He is in us full and complete. We need to realize the fullness of him that filleth all in all. He started by filling us up. And that's how he started this thing. He started by... You know, we, we, ask, we say we ask Jesus in our heart, but he comes in and he fills us full. He is the fullness now. When we accepted Jesus, we accepted the cross, which did away with us. We accepted the resurrection, which brought Christ forth. And now we say, not I, but Christ. That's called filled full. That's the, you know what? That's the beginning. Now, we, it seems like it takes us years to find out the beginning. But the beginning is we're filled full with the Logos. Now, through the Son, by being placed in Him and Him in us, we have full relationship with the Father. Remember the beginning? We've entered into that fullness. It's not a temporal fullness filled with weddings and water pots and things and us trying to do certain things. Oh, if I do, if I feel this full, will I be accepted by you, Jesus? That wasn't what they were doing. They were acting by faith on his word and faith produced it. That's what they were doing. They weren't earning uh, acceptance by their acts. They were already accepted in the beloved and acted on his word. Uh-huh, Roger?
That's exactly right. And, and, and we forget that. We, we, we do something that results in seeing or results in new wine. And we pervert that by stepping back and going, I must be acceptable to God now. Do you see what I'm saying? I must, because I did this, this happened, which proves that I'm in tune with God and I must be something special. That ain't it. He did, he did it because, and he did it because they acted in faith. Your word said to do it. I did it. You did that. I didn't turn it into wine. I just filled it up. You did what it, the deal. And all that can be said of me is that I believed you when you said, go fill it up. I didn't go, oh, that's stupid. <laughs> and he said, Jesus said, be it, unto, be it unto you according to your faith. <laughs> be it unto you according to your faith. And you, know, and, you know, and it is. It is. It is. All the time, every day, it is, a, it is unto you according to your faith. I hear people say, well, I don't believe God would do so-and-so. You know what they're saying? I believe God wouldn't do so-and-so. It will be according to their faith. God won't, because you don't believe he will. You know? And so, and everybody believes something. Everybody is a believer. It's just what you believe. You know? You believe, if, if your belief is that you have every right to be fearful because there's a devil out there and there's, you know, all, you know, there's all these dangers and snares and everything. You, let me tell you, David knew all about dangers and snares, but he also knew about the one to go to and to say, hey, you know, keep my foot from stumbling and from going into the snare of the fowler. And the times when he did go into the snare of the fowler, he said, Lord, deliver me. You know what I mean? I wish you could understand what I'm saying. Um, I was sharing with somebody the other day, life is not... Life down here, as we live it, is not as is not as dangerous as we think when we're walking with the Lord, who is not of this realm. We go, we do something, we thoroughly mess it up. That's not the end of life. That's not the end of it. Oh, I've d that's just it. That's it. Then I, I just, I've totally. You know, no, okay? I'm living here at this moment. I step into this moment. I do something that I shouldn't have done. I've got the next moment. It's like all these squares. I've got the next square and the next square and the next square of the next day and the next day and the next day to begin to sow seeds opposite of that, to reverse that course, to get out of agreement with it. Uh, even if I set it in motion at that moment, you throw seeds in that little parcel, you can spend the next rest of your life every day in hope as you sow seeds that will eventually overtake those and choke them out. I mean, there's hope all at every moment because nothing is permanent if you don't... I mean, now you throw bad seeds here and you're stepping in bad seeds here and you just keep throwing bad seeds and you go, I don't care. I don't need the Lord. Well, it'll all come up and it'll get you. But if, you, if you're living for God as much as you know how and you do something wrong because you don't know everything and you don't know every circumstance, you don't know all the wiles of the enemy and you slip up, that's not the end of the world. God will show you, you know, but see, we don't, we just go, I think I slipped up. I go, Lord, if I slipped up, show me exactly, specifically, so that I can repent, because you want me to repent, so that I can know how not to be in agreement with the enemy, because you don't want me in agreement with the enemy, so that I can walk in your word. So show me specifically, not just generally this spooky, oogie-boogie feeling that I'm out of whack with God, and, and walking every day going, I'm out of whack with God, and I don't know what it is, and... You know, and the devil's going, well, it must be bad. And, you know, he adds to it more and more every day until you're off in space land. You know what I mean? You, uh, you, you get that feeling. I'm out of whack. I don't know exactly what it is. Holy Spirit, you're my God. You're my teacher. 
uh, I'm really going to need this because you're the one who told me to repent. I can't repent of something that I don't know specifically what it is. You're the one that wants me free and you're the one that's going to lead me to freedom. So show me how to walk out of that. And thank you. Once you ask, you, you, you're supposed to like, it's called believe. You're a believer. You, you become a believer. Is that okay? You go, I believe you're going to show me. You don't say, now until you show me, oh, I don't know what it is, and I'm scared. And I, you, you go, well, I will know what it is. I'm going to know what it is. I'm going to see clearly. And the path of the righteous gets brighter and brighter, just like the new day. And I'm going to know, and the Holy Spirit, my God, he'll guide me into all truth. He didn't say, well, I'll show you some things, you know, if you're lucky. You know, I'll guide you into all truth. He'll teach you things to come. He'll teach you things concerning me. Okay. Now he'll reprove you of sin. He doesn't, the Holy Spirit does, doesn't, you know, like you messed up and he kind of walks by and goes, you really messed up and then walks off. You know, so that you have this brush with the Holy Spirit that says, who you really messed up. And so you, so it's your job without his presence to wander around. And that was his reproof. The devil does that. The Holy Spirit will reprove you, and the word reprove means rebuke you to the point of bringing you so that you're right. The word rebuke means you don't want to hear it. The word reprove means he'll bring you to it, and he will reprove you. He will, which means he will show you what you did wrong and how to do it right and everything. So if he really will, you go... Okay, I ask you, I don't see nothing, you know, I just got this spooky feeling, you know, is that you? He goes, no, no, I'm going to lead you into all truth, so quit going with that. Okay, you know, I have confidence now. And that doesn't mean your soul doesn't, but you don't go by your soul, so who cares what your soul does? Well, I do because I live by it. Well, that's why you, that's why you go. That's why you go through all this stuff. But I'm talking to a spiritual person, a believer who believes not by his soul because his soul is being blessed at the moment and feels like agreeing with God, but if you bring anything contrary to that, I'll go shivering in a corner and go, I was God, I thought you were going to be here for me. And he's standing there going, I haven't moved, you have. You're the one over there shaking and shivering and freaking out. I haven't moved, I'm here. I, you know, like uh, God appeared to Abraham 13 years after he had Ishmael and appeared to him, knocked him down on the ground, said, as for me, my covenant is with you. When are you going to plug back into me, Jack? Abraham, Jack. When are you going to plug back into me? As for me, my covenant is with you. Not, okay, you know. You say, but he said, walk before me and be thou perfect. The word perfect means mature. Understanding having a mature relationship with him based on the cross, the blood of Jesus that covers all sin. You know, that's a mature relationship when, when he has provided. I mean, you don't even know his heart. He's provided this glorious gift and you don't accept it. You're in doubt of him and you're not trusting him and you're you know I don't want to come boldly because I really think that you're against me because you're really some slime ball that wants to zap me I know what you're like but I can't say that in public I never worship my hands and say, oh great slime ball thank you but you think that why don't you or become a believer and say my soul has fears I know it has fears but I've got to stand firm. I've got to stand, having done all, stand. You know? And go, you're, you did, you know, I mean, I know why you died on the cross. You shed your blood so that if I come, if I never messed up, you'd accept me. He shed his blood because he knew you messed up for every time you messed up. Not I shed my blood so that you'll never mess up so that I can accept you. He shed his blood so he could accept you no matter what you did. And then, knowing that, 
you will come boldly and after a while you'll build this relationship with him because you ain't going to get close to talk to him and let him tell you the secret things in the secret place of the most high because you're come you know you're either like this with god or you come crawling in there and get his mercies and run out before he's at you again you're not gonna you're not, not gonna learn the secrets of his heart you're not you're never gonna learn those things until you've begun to be full with his righteousness until you've begun to accept the relationship that he truly has for you i died for you i died for you and you go you die for me forgive me now tell me teach me this is unbelievable i mean it's unbelievable to you you just you just are continually amazed you're not worthy and you're not anything but you just go but you don't just go you don't just go oh that's good you died for me good. forgive me of them sins i'll be back in here tomorrow with some more to cash in and go out and sin You don't do that. You go, my God, you you died? You bore those stripes? You took that for me? And he goes, and you go, man, I ain't this way, but I sure would like to be that way. I mean, I'm not that way at all. And he says, well, that's one of the reasons why I died, because... I, that's my bridge to get you from over there to over here so that you can conform to what I'm like. But if you don't take my bridge of the blood and my forgiveness and my great grace and my great love, you'll always get it and run back across the bridge. And you'll always be in the old grabbing the benefits of the new instead of coming over and going, man, I, I'm... I receive it. And then you walk, you know, you walk out as it were, you don't really, but you, you know, and the devil hits you with stuff and, devil, and or, you, or maybe the devil doesn't do anything and you just mess up and you do bad and maybe you do something selfish. Well, what a surprise until you're totally conformed to his image. I think you're going to do some selfish things, but the goal isn't to never do selfish things. His heart is to build a relationship with him and go, man, I did something selfish and come in and go, man, I'm selfish and I don't even know if I want to repent of that because I really liked it. But when I look at you, I really want to be like you. Do you see the difference? That's being real. I mean, I, I did that selfish thing because I'm selfish and I, and I didn't want to give up that selfish thing. But when I look at you, I want to be like you. I don't want to be selfish. But I am. And he goes, I know. That's why I died. That's what the cross is all about. That's what redemption is all about. That's what we're doing here. We're building a relationship. And I'm going to bring you into this if you want to. And say, that's why I'm in here. That's why I didn't do something selfish and go, oh, and run away and go, forget God. I mean, I know that he don't like me anymore. Oh, yeah. You know, the scripture says, if God be for us, who can be against us? Who shall condemn you? Shall he that laid down his own life? The one who died for it, shall he condemn you? <laughs> you know what I mean? So the one that bought and paid for it so that you there is no more condemnation condemn you? No, he's not going to condemn you. But our ignorance condemns us. Our ignorance. Under the old covenant that says, God, I have an old covenant relationship with him. God hates sin. I'm guilty. He's going to kill me. Folks, God hates sin. You're guilty. Jesus died. Figure it out. It's called the New Testament. <laughs> and believe it. Come on. You know, we say enter into the 90s. Come on, folks. Enter into the New Testament. <laughs> Come on. You say it, ain't you? <laughs> no, not me. <laughs> Eric? That helps, too.
Well, and, and everyone may not have that experience, but if, if I will, my experience over the years has been that I've been hit by a wave of scriptures that declare the love of God. Over and over, he, the word keeps confirming to me that he's for me and that all of this death and all of this that he's gone through and the whole bit was that he might have sons in the image of Christ, not just sons, sons in the image of Christ, and that's what I want, though I'm not totally in that image. And so I, be, I became a believer that is helping me to, those, to as many as received him, gave he the power to become the sons of God. And, and so I, I received and I'm believing and I'm becoming in that sense. And um, for somebody else, it may be circumstantially a different set of, you may not feel waves of love or you may not be hit by scriptures over and over. There may be circumstances where you get down and God just is there for you time and time. I don't know. But eventually, the goal isn't to have a bunch of experiences where every time you get down, God has to give you another experience. Eventually, the love that brought that first experience and the second and the third is to be believed so that if another wave never comes, if another scripture is never enlightened to you, if another circumstance never is, you're jerked out of, you go, but I know what you're like. I know. I know you. And the devil sets up circumstances and says, God's left you. You say, no, he's not like that. Man, I've been challenged on this many a time in major ways. And, you know, circumstances and you know, Job, man, you know, God left you and all this kind of stuff and whatever. And, it, you know, you're out there and it's all over with. And you just go, hey, I can't explain what's going on, but I know my father. And I know what Jesus did on the cross. And I'm sorry, I ain't going to change. I will not remove from this place of faith. And then time would come. And sure enough, you know, the, the clouds blow away and there's the sun and you go, see, I knew he was there all the time. Just some stinking clouds got in the way where I couldn't see him. But you feel like an idiot if you go go running around, you know, for two weeks going, ah, the sun's gone, the sun's gone, oh my God, the sun's gone. And the clouds part and you go, ah. this, oh, you know, I guess it was there all the time. I feel real stupid, you know. And then the next time that happens, do the same thing. And that's, you know what I mean? And so, you know, eventually we, we want to learn some things about God, you know. The stability, the love, the, the, the faithfulness of God. And he is love, you know. He has attributes, but love is not an attribute of God. God is love. It's not just an attribute. God is love. Okay, what I'd like for you to do is, uh, between now and next class, um, is to look over, let's see, what is it, verse, beginning with verse, let's start with, uh, um, let's start with verse 13, and do verse 13 through... Let's just stick with 13 through 17, although the rest of this carries out uh, much of that same deal. But 13 through 17, what I'd like for you to do is read those scriptures, come up with a list of things, like we listed deals here. You got us. What you know? What you have there. You have a list of. You have you have a list of things that comprise what we call the particular circumstance of or thing that caused that event. There are things put together that cause an event that we call a circumstance. That we just discovered that this was a, and all there's more, we didn't list them all. All these are is things that have been put in a certain order that we call a circumstance. But what we did was we saw through the circumstance into the spiritual reality of it, and Jesus marched right through the circumstance with the Father, moving with the Spirit, and 
the glory of God was seen to the Father, though maybe nobody else saw it. And others may have been confused. Some may have been blessed. Well, what we want to do is learn first from the Scripture so that the Holy Spirit can teach us, and then in real life that each thing is made up of a list of things that are put in a certain order that are called circumstances which don't mean nothing in themselves, but they have, especially when it comes from the Scripture, spiritual meaning behind it that explains what's going on. If you learn that from the Scriptures, you will eventually one day be able to face life that way and go, look, oh, I see this and that and that. Lord, what's really going on? He'll say, da 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 And you, can, you will see that you will be able to walk through things not all freaked out like everybody else, not all panicky, and they'll go, what's the deal with that person? And you'll go, I am flowing with the Lord in this, and I'm not motivated by the waves and the this and that. I'm just walking with the Lord on the water. And that's what every one of us want. Well, the only way I know how to help you get there is just in very practical ways. Let's do it first in the Scriptures. Get in the habit of doing it. We got lots of scriptures to go through here in John, don't we? Lots of things that can be put in an order called a circumstance, and we're going to just keep marching through, and we're going to see Jesus every time. Is that cool? Father, thank you for this time. More importantly, thank you for what your Spirit is doing in this time, what you're accomplishing, and what you are bringing us toward, because even what you are able to accomplish in this time is only that which is added to what you've previously accomplished and what, what you will, will one day co accomplish to bring it all together. Father, help us to not live so linearly, so caught up, so, Lord, tossed by every wave, every storm that comes along, but to live above because we are above. We're in Christ. His life is in us. Father, I pray for each person here. Continue to tenderize their heart and make them soft to your Holy Spirit. Help them from even this lesson to be able to approach the Scriptures differently. And from that, the Holy Spirit will have me.